the quest to exhume every retro horror game in existence continues as we dig into a system that never quite caught on in North America, despite having a pretty cool and diverse selection of games, especially once you consider the Japanese exclusive releases and an eventual CD add-on. In this video, we'll attempt to excavate the scary, spooky, and sometimes silly side of horror of this unique console library, including some adjacent genres with frightening flavors. Ranging from well-recognized franchises to oddities you might never have heard of before, let's explore the creepiest of deep cuts on the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine. We'll come out swinging with one of the most well-known horror classics on the system with Splatterhouse. The first home port of Namco's blood-soaked beat-em-up, originally released in arcades in 1988 and brought to the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics in 1990. You play as Rick, resurrected by the terror mask within a monster-infested mansion and in search of your girlfriend Jennifer. Building on the brawler pedigree of side-scrolling punch-em-up classics like Kung Fu Master, You'll punch, kick, jump, slide, and generally lumber around Voorhees style through seven stages full of a variety of gross and slimy ghouls to splatter into a goopy mess. The copious gore and obvious influence from horror and slasher films takes center stage here, even making Splatterhouse one of the first known arcade games to have a parental advisory warning and became the apex of graphic violence on home consoles once it found its way to the Turbo Graphics. The home version does differ a bit from the arcade original, with various cutscene animations removed, some changes to the weapon pickups, and some toned down gory bits, and the North American version would also see all religious symbols removed, some slight changes to the ending, and at the forefront, a purple mask for Rick to make his inspiration from Jason a little less blatant. So these days, you might opt for the arcade original for the full and true experience, but the TG-16 version is still certainly a really well-made port. General opinions can vary with the quality of the gameplay. It's pretty straightforward once you start seeing what sort of substance is underneath all of the style, and can certainly be cleared in an hour or two once you memorize the levels and get more precise with Rick's heavy and clunky feeling movement. It does have occasional branching pathways to mix things up a bit, and you could certainly challenge yourself further by going for a 1cc or a deathless run, but the atmosphere alone makes it an obvious must-play for any fans of retro horror games, and of course it went on to spawn a few more great titles like the very fun rambunctious spin-off on the Famicom with Wanpaku Graffiti, two excellent direct sequels on the Sega Genesis, and an eventual 3D reboot in 2010. Dracula, the Fürst der Finsternis, Herr des Teufels Schlosses, ist auferstanden. Castlevania would be another staple horror franchise finding its way onto the system in 1993 with Rondo of Blood, released exclusively in Japan at the time for the PC Engine CD add-on as Akumajo Dracula X Chi no Rondo, the 10th Castlevania game in Konami's hit series. I have to admit, it wasn't until 30 years later that I finally gave this a proper spin, and man was I missing out on one of the best games in the series. You play as Richter Belmont, and another whip-cracking action platformer seeing you try and rescue your girlfriend from Count Dracula with a similar feel to previous entries in the franchise, but packaged with even more polished presentation thanks to being its first appearance on a CD-based platform. Right off the bat, we are treated to cutscenes, voiceover, and remarkable pixel art and environments that would set a new standard for the series, and even see some of its sprites reused in future titles like Symphony of the Night, this game's direct sequel. Your play controls would be expanded a bit from previous classic Belmonts with a backflip maneuver, along with dramatic item crash techniques that vary depending on your sub-weapon. Your abilities can branch out even further if you happen to rescue Maria out of level 2, another playable character with a different set of very cute animal-based weaponry, a double jump, 
and some other special abilities. Her inclusion adds a lot of replayability to the game as you can approach encounters in entirely different ways, and it even lightens up the tone of some of the cutscenes. The levels themselves also can be completed in different ways, with branching pathways in many of the stages, multiple maidens to rescue in hidden areas, and a save function to be free to re-explore as much as you like. Back this all with an incredible soundtrack with a little bit of funky flavor mixed in, intense and creative boss battles, and that trademark tough but fair level of Castlevania challenge, and you've got a formula for a masterpiece of the macabre. While being exclusive to Japan for a while, this game would eventually find its way stateside in various ways, first with a kind of reworked but quite different take on the Super Nintendo with Dracula X, a remake on the PSP with Dracula X Chronicles, a Wii Virtual Console release, and it also was included with the Castlevania Requiem collection on the PS4. However you can get your hands on this one, I highly recommend checking it out as an essential and landmark entry in the series and certainly one of the best games on the PC Engine, period. <laughs> Two years later, in 1995, another game with smatterings of Castlevania on its sleeve would hit the CD add-on with Rennie Blaster, a side-scrolling brawler with some gothic flavor. While it does have a lot of Japanese text and voice acting in multiple cutscenes and dialogue moments, it's still very playable without knowing the language. One of the more striking things you'll notice right away with this game is a pretty expansive and fairly intuitive moveset for each of the two characters. With a detective, you can jump, kick, and punch with various button combinations, along with an assortment of other moves executed by holding down the attack button and letting go at various levels of charge. On top of this, you can find scrolls to unlock new moves and select new loadouts for the following stages. And the other character you can eventually choose also has an entirely unique moveset more focused on magical projectile attacks, which really adds a nice variety to the action as you beat down everything in your path. And this seems very promising, but unfortunately the enemies you fight are absolute idiots. It won't take long to figure out the easiest way to kill everything. Don't expect much from the platforming sections either. While your jumping is totally functional and fine, these areas of the levels just kind of feel like padding and don't really add much to the experience. And while there are plenty of pretty cool boss encounters, it also will only take a short bit of experimentation to figure out which one of your moves will break their weak AI. It's a fairly short game as well. Even if you listen to all of the voice acting, you can get through this in about an hour or less, there are some multiple endings with slight differences to check out if you really wanted to. Despite that, something about this whole experience is pretty neat. The art style is vibrant, the music is nice, and the character animations are smooth, and pulling off all of your different slick looking maneuvers is probably the highlight of the game. The static but gritty anime cutscenes give a nice retro comic booky vibe to everything, and it's too bad there isn't an English translation for this one yet, as I'm genuinely curious to know more about the game's story and characters. But given its obscurity, I am not expecting one anytime soon. Regardless, if you've ever dreamed of throwing bad dudes in Castlevania into a blender, Rennie Blaster is probably worth a look sometime. The genre hybridization will get even more unhinged with Beyond Shadowgate, a sequel to the point-and-click adventure classic Shadowgate, released exclusively for the Turbo CD in North America in 1993. Rather than retaining the screen-by-screen -screen POV perspective of their successful MacVenture classics in the past, the developer's ICOM simulations opted for a 2D perspective of your player, along with some basic point-and-click menuing and very primitive beat-em-up functionality. The story continues from the first Shadowgate game, with you in control of Prince Eric, heir to the throne of Lord Jair, who is recently assassinated. To make matters worse, you are soon framed and thrown in prison, so your adventures begin with your escape and eventual quest to uncover the culprits behind your father's death and reclaim the kingdom.
Getting back to the gameplay, it may feel starkly different at first, since right from the beginning you have to react to things in real time with your fists, as opposed to taking your time click by click. And your character's movement is extremely stiff to say the least, don't expect this to feel like a proper brawler. Beyond punching and ducking, your point and click capabilities include examining, speaking, interacting, and of course using items in weird and unusual ways to bypass whatever obstacle impedes you. Good day. Are you the keeper of the bridge? It's my bridge, all right. Nobody passes until they pay me. And also in classic Shadowgate fashion, random stuff will kill you in various gruesome and hilarious ways. So don't forget to save often. And once you progress beyond the prison and out into the world, all sorts of paths open up to you, and there's even a lively town to explore, giving off a much different vibe from the isolated dungeon crawly feel of the original. Overall, it's a pretty different experience and undeniably janky at times, but still a pretty fun and fascinating adventure that almost feels more like point and clicks of the era being made by Sierra and LucasArts, like Quest for Glory. Certainly worth a look for adventure game fans. The pointing and clicking will continue here, but blast forward to 1999 with the final official release on the PC Engine CD with a compilation disc including Dead of the Brain 1 and 2, a pair of zombie-laden visual novel games that were originally released for the PC-98 and also ported to other Japanese computer platforms in the early 90s. Developers Fairy Tale would experiment outside of their usual Iroge games, with this foray into a story oddly nestled somewhere between Return of the Living Dead and The Terminator, with a heavy focus on gore, but still some naughty bits of sleaze here and there. This PC Engine CD release several years later would benefit from Redbook audio and voice acting, and luckily a translation patch was recently completed for the first game, but no luck on the second installment quite yet. Dead of the Brain 1 opens up from the point of view of Cole, who gets a call from his mad scientist friend who has created a serum that can bring the dead back to life, and then demonstrates the results on his dead cat, a cop shows up, chaos ensues, and we've got an instant zombie outbreak on our hands. The story unfolds as you and your friends must survive and begin unraveling the mysteries ahead, of course loaded with all sorts of horror tropes and movie references along the way. The gameplay is pretty typical of the visual novel genre, where you'll choose from various actions on each screen to interact with characters and uncover new information from your surroundings. Don't expect too much depth with the puzzle solving, as this ultimately amounts to looking at everything and talking to everyone multiple times until nearly every bit of text has been exhausted and you can progress to a new scene. From time to time, there is a kind of quick time action sequence where you might have to gouge a zombie's eyeballs out, or select the right sequence of actions before you get killed. I'm on the fence as to whether these are exciting or annoying. I guess it depends on how many times you have to keep retrying it until you find the right pixel to click on before the often painfully short timer expires. But if you're alright with this kind of slow burn gameplay, this is a pretty cool little 2-3 hour adventure with an audacious story and clear nods to classic zombie and horror movies, and some great pixel art for any gore hounds. And it also includes some pretty surprising twists and turns here and there. It is a bit unfortunate that what could have been a hugely surprising plot twist is basically spoiled by the game's cover art, but the way it's eventually revealed might at least catch you off guard. In the end, it's about as satisfying as an evening with some direct-to-video 90s horror trash, so if you're like me, that's a damn good time. I don't have too much to say about Dead of the Brain 2, since it hasn't been translated yet, but it does retain a similar interface and visual novel approach, but with a slightly different art style, and seems to go even heavier on the dialogue from the start. I brute forced through a few menus for a while, but it starts out with bikers being more of a menace than zombies, and from what I've read, they seem to be selling drugs laced with the zombie serum, so you could probably imagine where things go from there. The sequel doesn't seem to be as revered in underground circles as the first one, so I'm not holding my breath on a full translation for a while, 
But if one comes out someday, I certainly wouldn't mind giving this one a try to get deeper into the lore of the series. Another classic Japanese computer game that would eventually get a PC Engine conversion is Shiryo Sensen, or War of the Dead, a survival horror action RPG originally released in 1987 for the MSX and ported to the PC-88 and PC Engine in 1989. While the title might have you assuming it's a zombie apocalypse kind of situation, it's more of an interdimensional eldritch jam, and luckily has received a fan translation making it fully playable in English. You play as Lila, a paranormal investigator on a mission to rescue the survivors of Cheney's Hill and find the source of all the foul creatures running amok in the area. You'll encounter all sorts of NPCs in what kind of amounts to a long chain of fetch quests, but at least many of these characters are entertainingly named after horror icons, like Romero, Carpenter, Cronenberg, Wes, and so on so you can have some fun seeing if you can catch all the references strewn about. The gameplay is partially inspired by classic Dragon Quest games with a top-down overworld view for exploring, interacting with characters, and random encounters. But the combat takes more inspiration from Zelda 2's side-scrolling action sequences, where you can jump, stab, and shoot through the monsters you run into. You can gain experience points whenever an enemy drops a blue orb and level up your stats a bit, which is something you will definitely want to grind out for a while at the start of the game, or you'll soon start running into enemies that can drop your health to zero pretty quickly. And unfortunately, the PC Engine version is lacking any kind of save functionality, and instead has an absurdly complex password system that puts River City Ransom to shame. The game has a couple of other somewhat annoying quirks, one being that you'll need to be very diligent in talking to everyone, sometimes multiple times in order to trigger whatever conversation flag is necessary to keep progressing in the game. Despite that and some other things that haven't aged super well, it's still a pretty fascinating game, especially considering it as a super early example of the survival horror genre, even predating influential games like Sweet Home on the Famicom. I think if you go into it being accepting and aware of its shortcomings, maybe make your life easier with some save states, it's definitely worth checking out for horror fiends. Maybe even check out the other MSX and PC-88 versions as well, as they each have their own unique differences and features. Speaking of shortcomings, let's take a look at Night Creatures, a TurboGrafx-16 exclusive released in 1992, developed by Manly & Associates, who I'm sure you know are responsible for gems like Pink Goes to Hollywood, Wizard of Oz on the Super Nintendo, and Ninja Gaiden 2, the DOS version. So here we have a hot mess of a Metroidvania where you play as some dude who has been bitten by Hekate in the form of a bat and must kill him by sunrise in order to avoid permanently becoming a night creature. In non-linear fashion, you can explore the area, find new weaponry, kill the corresponding boss that is only vulnerable to a certain weapon, gain the generally useless power to transform into various animals, and ultimately get really annoyed at how broken this game is. I like to consider myself pretty open-minded to things that are a little rough around the edges, but man, the hitboxes and play control in this game really pushed my limits. Essentially, your attacks will just constantly miss the mark You'll get bounced around the screen without many invincibility frames to work with, and all that just to get into a boss fight that you probably can't even do any damage if you chose the wrong area to delve into. If anyone out there has any advice on how to make this game not suck so much, I'm all ears. And we'll stay in the non-linear beast mode nano genre for a few games here, next checking out the Turbo CD port of Shadow of the Beast, an eye-popping Amiga cult classic infamous for its surreal visuals and punishing difficulty, and a title that has seen lots of different ports on various platforms. 
and it actually lands pretty well in this version, not just with the addition of some animated cutscenes and CD quality remixes of the soundtrack, but also some difficulty rebalancing, and it actually gives you more than one life to work with if you want. Gluttons for Punishment may scoff, but it's a nice way to actually see more than 10 minutes of the game, and experience the wild assortment of ladder climbing and creature punching that awaits. It's certainly not without some of the original's flaws, but out of the versions I've tried, this might be one of the more approachable ports without tinkering with the authentic experience too much. I would like to know who signed off on the volume levels of the footstep sounds, though. There is a single light in the darkness. His name is Lycos. And in yet another Animorphs, I mean, a uh, horror game, we have Shapeshifter, another work from ICOM Simulations, released on the Turbo CD in 1992. Definitely more on a dark fantasy tip than pure horror here, but you are put in control of a beefy barbarian named Lycos on a quest to rescue five wizards from the Dark Ones, and gaining a new transformation ability with each wizard saved. This one is also a bit non-linear, starting out in a town hub with all sorts of fully voiced townspeople to interact with and buy stuff from, and eventually you venture out into the wilds, encountering the usual assortment of giant spiders and weird skeletal abominations. <laughs> Admittedly, I haven't gotten too far in this one yet, but my first impressions of the game are pretty good. The presentation is well done with some detailed pixel art, some cool parallax effects, solid and plentiful voice acting, and I'm actually really excited to unlock the eventual shark transformation. Now this is all great on paper, but I have heard that the latter half of this game gets rather frustrating with a lack of convenient save points and some very janky platforming something we will encounter again in some other ICOM developed games later in the video. Despite that, I may have to flip the masochism switch here and power through this one at some point. Rise from your grave. And Sega's arcade classic Altered Beast would also rise from its grave and get ports on both the PC Engine and PC Engine CD, which is the version we're looking at here. One of the most notable additions you'll see right away is this story option on the title screen, giving us a nice little slideshow with a mix of recycled digitized art assets, Japanese voiceover, and that. Nice. And once you get into the actual game, you might get truly horrified if you're more used to the very solid Sega Genesis port. Visually, it's only a little altered, but fine overall. But once you start pressing buttons, you're in for a lag fest, especially when it comes to your jumping. Being that this beat-em-up feels pretty heavy and clunky in the first place, I found this made things even more challenging, but for really annoying reasons. The CD version also throws in some loading time in the middle of levels, and it just generally had me wishing I was playing a different port. Check it out if you're morbidly curious sometime, but otherwise you could probably just get away with watching a video of the cutscene that's exclusive to this version. And to go on a quick tangent here, dark fantasy is a theme I've always felt to be very adjacent to horror, and it opens up another pool of great games that we won't fully dive into today but here's a handful to get you started on a quest of exploring the swords and sorcery side of the library. If you need another cursed port of a Sega classic, you could subject yourself to this horrendous version of Golden Axe on the PC Engine CD, or for some side-scrolling hack and slashing, you can journey through Kadash, Rastan Saga 2, or the wonderful Legendary Axe series. The console also has no shortage of dank dungeon crawling action, including Double Dungeons, Dungeon Master, Order of the Griffin, Brandish, or the quality gauntlet-like Dungeon Explorer games. And finally, if you're into some anime girl-infused Castlevania-like experiences, you definitely don't want to miss the Valis franchise. 
On that note, I do want to shed some light on Facette Amour, a title I'm sure I'm not pronouncing correctly, but is an intriguing girl versus grotesque demons adventure on the PC Engine CD. Playing like some kind of mashup of Castlevania, Valis, Ghouls and Ghosts, and Bionic Commando, it's a pretty solid little action platformer, also loaded with fully voiced anime cutscenes and a fair bit of fan service. Your chain whip grappling hook thing gives you an interesting assortment of attacks and aerial maneuvers, which aren't the most intuitive things to execute, but certainly provide some unique gameplay mechanics. The stages feel a little generic, and the pace often plods about. And honestly, there isn't a ton of challenge here, but in searching for horror-themed stuff, I did find the variety of creatures to kill and especially rad-looking boss encounters might scratch that demon-hunting itch. And don't pack up your armor quite yet, as one of these horror compilation videos wouldn't be complete without our boy Arthur making appearance, with Dai Makai Mura, released on the exotic Super Graphics console variant in 1990. The Super Graphics was a modest update to the PC Engine hardware and a commercial failure, only leading to five console-specific releases. But I suppose if it did anything right, it was this very faithful arcade conversion of Capcom's hit Ghouls and Ghosts. The good old two loops of brutal difficulty and cartoony horror platforming is in top form here, slightly surpassing the already impressive Genesis version in terms of arcade accuracy, and certainly of interest if you're a fan of the series and have the means to try one of its more obscure versions. Another spooky arcade port would hit the PC Engine CD add-on with Horror Story from Toplan, aka Demon's World. These developers may be more commonly known for shmups like Truxton and Zero Wing, but they would also occasionally foray into platformer territory, and this auto-scrolling run-and-gun would be one of their more bizarre excursions. You and maybe a buddy can control a legally distinct Ghostbuster, and blast through a wide array of spooky environments and all sorts of very goofy looking ghouls and silly skeletons. The power-up system is pretty straightforward, with weapons ranging from lasers to rockets to bombs, and there is usually a cycling weapon power-up item scrolling along the screen to change things up when needed, but no scaling efficiency in any of them. You're unable to shoot upwards unless you have the spread shot, but you at least do have a substantial double jump to get around the screen. You can also collect enough peas to eventually get a shield, but otherwise the game is one hit KO and you'll have just a handful of credits to get through a traditional pocket emptying arcade experience. It might not bring any big innovations to the genre, but it has a very fun and rambunctious feel with the wide array of creatures and yokai that you run into, a surreal and spoof-like vibe not unlike something like Monster Party on the NES and the whole thing just drips of Halloween goodness. This particular conversion is also quite similar and faithful to the arcade original, but with some CD audio enhancements to the music, and it mixes things up with the stage order and adds a new boss and level exclusive to the PC Engine. And practically no game system or computer platform would be safe from getting an Adams Family game in the 90s after the release of the hit movie and corresponding merchandising push. The TurboGrafx CD would be no exception, and we'd get a somewhat unique experience compared to the other video game adaptations featuring the creepy and kooky Adams Fan. Brought to us again by ICOM Simulations, and one of their earliest attempts in making a platformer run-and-gun kind of thing, this take puts you in control of Tully, the family's shysty lawyer scheming his way to the family's fortune. Armed with an umbrella that shoots stuff, you'll wander the house, fight weird inanimate objects, have run-ins with family members, turn into a werewolf, and gradually unlock new areas of the mansion.
The whole thing feels a little surreal, especially with the soundtrack not far off from one of those spooky sound Halloween tapes, and not to mention a movie theater audience built into the screen's layout. And thanks to being on CD, there are moments of voice acting as well, but don't expect any FMV, just the occasional digitized photo here and there. Thanks for stopping by, Mr. Alford. I'm glad we spent this time together. But do you have to destroy my chemistry set? I sure hope you're happy. The game feel is certainly a bit floaty and janky, and some of the damage you take feels pretty cheap. But overall, it's honestly still pretty fun, and presents a decent challenge once you factor in the lack of continues. ICOM would bring us another spooky platformer with Ghost Manor, seeing a release on both the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics, and seemingly unrelated to Ghost Manor on the Atari 2600 from 1983. But you play as a kid named Arthur, who must reach the manor of Orb Gamut to save his village from horrible monsters and stuff. So, you'll run, jump, shoot, and just slip around and plummet to your doom through seven stages of a generally annoying experience. Rather than learn from the mistakes they made in Adam's family, Ghost Manor seems to double down on being absolutely irritating to play, as exploring the stages in search of a key has you dealing with constantly getting knocked around and repeating tedious platforming sections with slippery controls, limited ammo, and haphazard level layouts. Again, you might know I'm often on board for Goofy Jank from time to time, but this one is rough. Making progress on this will probably take some serious patience and stage analysis. It doesn't help matters much that your character looks like the uncool version of Kid Chameleon and without all of the cool abilities. I don't want to trash this one too much, since I couldn't get very far, but I feel like it's difficult for the wrong reasons, and I can't say it's one I'm excited to try again someday. Now we'll crank up the adorable meter a notch with Makai Prince Dorabo-chan, or Demon Prince Dorabo, an extremely cute platformer released exclusively in Japan, and might be recognizable as the predecessor to the twisted tales of Spike McFang on the Super Nintendo. You control the pudgy little vampire prince in a quest to save your master and rid the world of demons, and melons, taking in all the tomato sauce you can along the way. It's a fairly cookie-cutter action platformer, but with a very clean and cartoony art style, loaded with the typical Halloween monsters, but very light-hearted in tone, in a similar vein to Kid Dracula. I couldn't help but chuckle at some of the enemy and boss sprites, and you even get help from friendly Moai heads from time to time in various comedic ways. There are a handful of other power-ups as well, like various suits of armor granting different abilities, or syringes that freeze your enemies. Don't expect anything too deep here, but it's just a nice chunk of cheerful and colorful fun that rarely seems to get talked about. The Spike McFan game on the Super Nintendo is also definitely worth a look as well, albeit a very different gameplay approach, more akin to a top-down action RPG, but with the same light-hearted style and vegetable vampirism. <laughs> Now let's return to a feudal Japan with Namco's arcade classic Genpei Tomaden, originally released in arcades in 1986 with much success and reverence, and an eventual port to the Sharp X68000 in 1988, and the PC Engine version you're seeing here in 1990. You play as a resurrected samurai in a demon-infested Japan, hacking and slashing your way through all sorts of monsters and foes in an action platformer that varies between three different gameplay modes. Small mode is your usual platforming fare, but with a lot of frantic combat and quarter-munching levels of brutality, and notably has some alternate exits to branch out to different level paths. There's also a big mode, with a chunkier and clunkier sprite to play with, 
and this is usually where you'll encounter boss enemies. And finally, there's Plane Mode, a top-down action perspective that seems to often show up whenever you fall down a pit. It all flows together fairly well and keeps the hectic action moving along nicely, although you might find some frustration with the recurring gambling with your life thing going on in the Sanzu River areas. Luckily, you do get unlimited continues to keep attempting to make progress through a healthy amount of stages and a fierce challenge. The PC Engine version is regarded as being quite faithful to the arcade original, and while it may show its age at times, the chaotic action and classic yokai vibes kept me hitting the continue button. Follow-ups to this would include a weird physical board game hybrid release on the Famicom, which I covered in my first NES horror game video, and also this direct sequel in 1992, released in Japan and North America. Often sequels would be expected to expand on the gameplay of their predecessors, but for better or worse, Genpei Tomaden's follow-up, Samurai Ghost, would focus its action on the big mode sections of the original. Personally, I found these to be the most striking and memorable moments anyway, so I'm actually quite on board with this, although I can understand fans of the first game could be disappointed with this reduction. You still play as the same resurrected samurai, and things feel pretty similar this time around, but with a nice bit of extra polish. You have a few more power-ups and techniques at your disposal, generally tighter feeling controls, and overall, just a more matured and evolved design of the stages and their enemy behaviors. The presentation feels great as well, with some really beautiful backgrounds and dynamic environments, an energetic soundtrack, and of course lots of creepy and sometimes silly looking monster designs. In a quick survey of some past mainstream reviews I looked over, many reviewers of this game complained a lot about the weird marionette-like look and feel of your main character but I honestly think there's a very fun Jenkins Slash game underneath this if you give this a proper go, and certainly not deserving of the low review scores that I came across. Now swap that samurai with a ninja and the ghost with a spirit, and you've got Ninja Spirit, a 1988 IRAM arcade game, eventually ported to the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine, along with a variety of home computers. Amongst the sea of random ninja action games of the time, this one stands out pretty nicely, with a very foreboding atmosphere and mystical vibes in an alternate feudal Japan where you play as a ninja avenging the death of his father, who was murdered by a mysterious half-man, half-beast. Armed with a sword, shurikens, bombs, kusarigama, and potentially a couple of ninja clones, you'll be hacking and slashing your way through a hectic and action-packed seven stages. The game feel reminds me a lot of Legend of Kage, another arcade ninja classic, but definitely built upon with all of those extra weapons and frantic action set pieces, and definitely a satisfying challenge. The home version here has been toned down a lot from the brutal arcade original, giving you 5 health instead of dying in one hit, although some enemies can still insta-kill you. Masochists can turn on arcade mode for that one hit KO adrenaline rush, although this mode is still considered to be balanced more fairly than the arcade version. This one admittedly does not go super heavy on the horror themes and enemies, and you're generally just exploding ninjas at every turn, with the occasional ghostly apparition but it's such a good game, I'd be remiss not to mention this one. Another essential Ninja vs. Demons bio-horror experience not to be ignored is Hudson Soft's port of Ninja Ryukenden, or what you probably know as the NES version of Ninja Gaiden. Which I know I forgot to mention in the NES horror video, but I'll atone for that soon, trust me. Anyways, before the actually terrifying Ninja Gaiden Trilogy Super Nintendo release, Ryu Hayabusa would get the 16-bit treatment with this Japanese-exclusive PC Engine release in 1992, which stays somewhat faithful to the original, but has some interesting differences anyway. The core gameplay is basically intact, with a fairly similar feeling in the controls and level layouts mostly staying the same. You've got the same array of sub-weapons to utilize, 
although the Spin Slash is no longer a broken, boss-shredding powerhouse. Difficulty has been rebalanced a bit in some spots, and generally it feels to be a bit easier than the NES version, but a few slight changes might catch you off guard if you're trying to run through this one on autopilot. Cosmetically, some things are obviously changed, for better or worse. Some of the new backgrounds look pretty cool, and the colors look nice, but I'm not sure what they were thinking with these attempts at parallax scrolling. Those essential cutscenes are still here, by the way, and looking really good. It's worth noting that even though this did not come out stateside, there is a code you can put in to get English text for these. The music's also been changed, and while it's definitely decent, it's hard to compete with the memorable soundtrack of the original, which has already been burned into my brain over the years. And like Ninja Spirit, this title is not exactly heavy on the horror themes, but there's definitely some cool looking monsters here and there, and especially considering this different take on the final boss. While I still would 100% choose the NES version over this one, I suggest checking this version out if you're a fan of the series. And now it's time to get ready for some Samurai Space Harrier action with Jinmu Densho, a 1989 PC Engine title from Wolf Team, which somehow manages to combine being visually stunning, surprisingly innovative, and intensely frustrating in the same breath. The premise is pretty clear-cut. You must rid Japan of the demons and undead terrorizing the land, controlling a blonde samurai with some serious junk in the trunk, in a 3D action framework akin to the previously mentioned influential classic Space Harrier, but with some pretty substantial modifications. You're not limited to automatically flying forward, but can instead stop at any time or even backtrack a little bit if you need to grab a power-up. You're also bound by gravity, so you'll be jumping around instead of flying, and your weaponry is at first limited to close-range melee slashing, but eventually upgraded to more substantial and basically required projectile attacks. The scrolling effect is really smooth and pretty impressive for the hardware, but unfortunately things get hard to parse out once enemies and obstacles get involved, and the game suffers from some pretty extreme choppiness and sprite flickering, compounding the already challenging nature of the game into something that will take a lot of patience to endure. It gets even more maddening once you actually have to stay on platforms to survive, but luckily there is a password system for those willing to take on this janky journey. The payoff is probably the solid soundtrack, face-melting aesthetics, and some pretty cool boss fights and weird creatures to demolish. This isn't for everyone, but definitely a cool curiosity. More yokai blasting goodness awaits in Kiki Kai Kai, originally released in arcades in 1986 by Taito, and what you might recognize to be the humble beginnings of the Pocky and Rocky series. Eventually receiving a port on the MSX, a spin-off Zelda-like adventure on the Famicom Disk System, and this 1990 PC Engine version. You play as Sayo-chan, a shrine maiden in feudal Japan on a mission to rescue the seven lucky gods who have been whisked away by yokai, armed with Ofuda scrolls for projectiles and a Gohei wand for melee attacks. Gameplay takes the form of a top-down arcade action framework as you navigate through various levels at your own pace, blasting away all the ghostly obake and yurei you come across, with the challenge escalating in intensity nicely, as you make progress and eventually face off with large, detailed, and often hilarious looking bosses. It's certainly not the highly polished experience we would later get with Pocky and Rocky, but it's still pretty great considering how old the original was and was a breath of fresh air at the time, when the genre was generally dominated by sci-fi themes. The PC Engine version is pretty faithful to the arcade original, but with some minor tweaks and improvements and difficulty balancing, and especially welcomed are the three continues you're given to get through the substantial challenge. Despite its free-roaming nature, the enemy behaviors are well-designed in a way to keep you moving along at a brisk pace, but also to be smart about blindly charging forward and it's absolutely a solid and entertaining example of multi-directional shooters of the era. Mm. 
Another Taito arcade game ported to PC Engine that same year was Jigoku Meguri, originally released in arcades in 1988 and putting you in control of a Buddhist monk on a yokai infested romp through the underworld overrun with demons, armed with some big old beads. This was one of the more pleasant surprises to me while putting this video together, being that it's a really solid platformer that I had never even heard of before, with some very fun and whimsical Ghosts and Goblins-like vibes, albeit with some more reasonable difficulty. Don't expect a free ride here though, it's still a one-hit kill arcade-style beatdown at its core, once again with a limited number of continues to keep you refining your skills and learning the seven different stages. And I will admit to cackling very loudly the first time I saw the map screen. And are you tired of yokai yet? Because we got more of them. As I mentioned earlier though, things are definitely more in the playful and cartoony realm, and don't expect things to get really gross or gory. But Jigoku Meguri is absolutely a pleasure to play, tough but fair, and one I hope to conquer someday. We have another lighthearted take on Yokai and the Afterlife with Yokai Dochuki, a Namco arcade game from 1987 and later ported to the Famicom and PC Engine. You play as Tarusuke, a young mischievous boy banished to the demon infested purgatory like Jigoku, and you must make your way to Yama, the Buddhist deity that judges the dead to determine your final fate. It's a pretty straightforward platforming run and gun experience. But with a vibrant and goofy vibe, the boss fights are pretty neat as you kneel at a shrine and control a spirit to battle with fearsome Oni at the end of some of the stages. You can also collect money to buy power-ups at shops along the way, get distracted with gambling minigames, track down required hidden items and pathways, and even get a variety of endings depending on your score and amount of money collected by the end of the game. Overall, it's really a lot of fun, and the PC Engine version transfers the arcade experience really well, while also adding more content and some slight tweaks in the level design. We'll keep going down this road of arcade conversions with Tiger Road, a reimagining of Capcom's arcade title from 1987, which was also ported to all sorts of platforms, and getting this slightly more cartoony take on the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine. With a somewhat similar feel to Ghosts and Goblins, but more on the martial arts tip, you play as Lee Wong, and will be hacking and slashing through all sorts of goons and ghouls, and my favorite Chinese hopping vampires even make an appearance. You can grab a handful of different weapons you find along the way, and eventually power up your skills a bit after completing various training exercises in between stages. Now you'd think a health bar would make this a bit more forgiving than its ghostly cousin, but eventually things get so hectic that you might actually wish you were throwing torches at red armors. This game gets pretty insane, and defaults with three credits to get through a fairly lengthy experience, and although there is a backup function you can abuse to get unlimited tries and power through it. This definitely has some cool stuff going on, but brace yourself for frustrating knockback and tricky platforming, and buckle in for a toughie on this one. Speaking of toughies, the shoot 'em up classic R Type never fails to completely humble me and stifle any delusions of gaming grandeur that I might have. I'm no stranger to shmups, but for some reason this game always knocks me on my ass, and I wish I could show off more of this game in the footage, as it's full of all sorts of rad HR Giger inspired bio horror goodness. Someday I hope to really dig into this one, as while it may feel a bit slower paced than most games of the genre, there is a heavy emphasis on memorization and weapon strategy, almost making the game unfold as a real-time puzzle. Now it is interesting to note the various ways that R-Type was released for the PC Engine. Its Japanese version was separated into two separate hue cards, either for technical reasons or maybe for capitalism reasons. But the North American version was magically crammed onto one. Japan would also get a PC Engine CD release eventually, with both parts on one disc, and enjoying the additions of an intro cutscene and some pretty cool remixed music. But whatever way you play it, it's brutal, and truly a landmark title in the genre.
It's no secret that the Turbo Graphics is an absolute powerhouse for shoot 'em ups, and there are a healthy amount of them on the console featuring grotesque aliens and insects to explode and creepy body horror environments to navigate through. Or maybe you'll even find several cute em ups featuring adorable witches blasting away through all sorts of Halloween flavored ghouls. So we'll speed through a few games quickly here, and by no means is this an exhaustive list, but a few that I thought somewhat horror relevant. So on the slightly darker side of sci-fi themes, you've got Salamander, Cybercore, Dead Moon, Formation Armed F, Psychic Storm, Psychosis, The Lost Sunheart, and the medieval heavy metal banger Lords of Thunder. And on the adorable end of the spectrum, definitely check out Fantastic Night Dreams Cotton, Magical Chase, and Honey in the Sky, which also saw its Haniwa mascot in a side-scrolling sequel called Honey on the Road. Now this seems like a fine time to put on our spacesuits and delve into the sci-fi horror side of the library, first with this unique experience on the console with Silent Debuggers, developed by Data East and released in 1991. Hybridizing first-person shooters, dungeon crawlers, and survival horror, this one sets you up on a space station overrun with monstrous aliens on a well-paid mission to eradicate them and find out what exactly is going on here. You do have a partner to help guide you along the way as you work your way through all six floors, also utilizing a hub-like area to do things like change weaponry and recharge battery packs. Not long into your quest, you'll also set off a self-destruct timer, further adding to the impending dread of surviving this alien onslaught with just 100 minutes to do so. Adding to the tension is a sound detection system that you can use to determine the proximity of nearby enemies and even which direction they may be coming from if you're playing in stereo sound. The aliens can also eventually do damage to your recovery functions back at the core hub. All in all, it comes together into an interesting mix of reacting quickly and gunning down alien fiends, treading carefully to not get mauled, and forming good strategies for survival. Your results may vary as to whether or not this kind of interesting is going to actually be fun, but regardless, it's certainly an ambitious game for its time without anything else much like it on the Turbo Graphics. And if you're looking for a Metroid-like sci-fi horror experience on the system, look no further than Energy, released in 1989, and a loose remake of an older PC-88 game called Ash. And yeah, you might look on this with sadness and disappointment more than much else, but intrepid explorers of jank might want to check out this hot mess of broken platforming, incessant backtracking, and some wonderfully cursed-looking mutant sprites. Set in a post-apocalyptic Tokyo, you're tasked with rescuing the rest of your Toma Force Psychic Warrior Squad, along with any other innocents meandering about. Screen by screen, you'll run into various NPCs, upgrade your weaponry here and there, gather required items and dialogue triggers, and generally be bewildered by unpolished gameplay and unhinged game design. Apparently this port is actually a substantial downgrade from its PC-88 original in many ways, but fans of Kusogi out there might want to give this one a shot and have a few laughs. There's a lot of silliness here and there, and luckily there's an English patched version, which also happens to reduce the agonizingly substantial loading times between the screens of the original. Either way, hopefully you don't mind clearing a game with one life and no continues. And shout out to this room that just drains your health without explanation. Next up, let's check out Cross Wyber Cyber Combat Police, a side-scrolling action beat-em-up from Face, and follow-up to Cybercross. Not sure what a Wyber is, but both games have some heavy Power Rangers vibes going on, as you can power yourself up into a variety of battle suits for extra attack abilities. But the sequel here has amped up the bio-horror vibes a bit with some of the enemies, and I figured it was worth mentioning. Generally, it feels like a blend of Rolling Thunder and Robocop where your guy has a handful of punches and kicks to start, but eventually can go sentai mode and wield a sword, boomerang, or handgun, all of which can be upgraded if you're careful enough to grab the correct power-up. 
Gameplay somewhat plods along, and some of the platforming is a little annoying, but it's pretty fun anyway, and it also mixes things up a bit with a shmup section. Be sure to look up some cheat codes as well for a variety of difficulty modes or other gameplay tweaks. We'll get a little more slimy with Todd's Adventures in Slime World, which you might recognize from its releases on the Atari Lynx and Sega Genesis, but it also found a home on the PC Engine CD with a remix soundtrack and a rather hilarious anime-style cutscene intro mixed into this goopy experience. <laughs> The gameplay is pretty much untouched. For better or worse, it's similar to other versions and still includes the various scenarios to pick from at the start, as you guide Todd through various intricate tunnels of slime blasting away aliens and making sure to wash off the sludge every once in a while. This version does have differences in sound to the Genesis port thanks to some CD quality backing music, but somehow it still remains really abrasive and irritating, and poorly mixed volume levels in its sound effects. This is a game that can certainly get a bit tedious at times, but there is some merit to be had in the variety of modes, and might also be more fun in two-player split-screen. Now we'll hit the FMV Highway in It Came From The Desert on the Turbo CD, a full-motion video adventure reimagining of the Amiga point-and-click classic. Thematically, they may be similar, with their premise of giant mutant ants running amok, but this version features a completely different storyline, a new biker punk protagonist, and a wild tapestry of kooky characters, all on heavily dithered display here. You ever hear rhythm changes like that, kid? Well, now you have. Fans of 1950s B-movie horror camp will feel right at home, with some pretty hilarious cheese to be enjoyed in its acting and plot lines. The gameplay usually plays out more like a visual novel than the point-and-click original, but it does also fit in some moments of side-scrolling, top-down, or shooting gallery action as well. I can't really claim the game pulls off this mix of genres effectively, but I would argue it doesn't really have to. It's just a plain old fun and surreal experience for those who can get down with some low-resolution scuzz and rubber suit movie schlock. Figure this out, smartass! Don't kill him yet! Now hopefully you have a little popcorn left for a bit of kaiju goodness with Godzilla, a one versus one fighter released for the system's CD add-on in 1993. Godzilla games can certainly be hit or miss, but this one is actually really well assembled with a lot of care and love for the franchise. Single player mode has you facing off with a wide assortment of rivals from various films, all well designed and even making their signature sounds. Another nice little detail is how Godzilla's sprite will even change depending on how he looked in the first film face-off with that particular monster. Man, did they get some mileage out of the classic Godzilla roar sound. Gameplay-wise, Godzilla feels about as heavy and clompy as you would expect, but the controls are still very responsive and you have a surprising amount of attacks and maneuvers despite being limited to the two buttons of the TurboGrafx gamepad. For an added challenge, there is a hard mode, along with the end boss changing depending on your final score, so you'll need a near-perfect run in order to face the true final boss. Most of the monsters you defeat will also get unlocked for play in the two-player versus mode, which is surely the most fun way to enjoy this game. This is definitely a deep cut that deserves more attention for fans of Godzilla films and fighting games alike. and will bring some horror into the wrestling ring with Monster Pro Wrestling, released exclusively for the PC Engine in 1992. The premise here predicts that just seven years later in 1999, the world would be overrun with monsters, and a mad scientist creates his own mutant to take them on, 
in turn-based strategic wrestling combat, of course. You have four wrestlers to pick from, and a wide array of six-pack sporting monster opponents, from minotaurs to zombies. At the start and in-between matches, you can upgrade various stats and learn new abilities, and finally take your beastly beefcake into the ring in a round of RNG-based battling. The randomness is a bit annoying, but you'll still be laughing your ass off anyway at the hyperkinetic and absolutely ridiculous animation sequences that unfold during your match. This game unfortunately has not been translated into English, but it's still somewhat playable regardless, and highly entertaining to watch these guys battle it out and eventually explode into chunks. In a decidedly more strategic but unfortunately far less goofy time, we also got a monsterized version of the classic Japanese board game Shogi, not too far removed from chess, but admittedly a game I do not actually know the rules for. Morita Shogi on the PC Engine feels very inspired by the likes of Battle Chess, with the pieces being swapped out with various creatures and simple fighting animations between them, but their interactions don't really feel as creative. It includes a standard basic version of Shogi as well, but otherwise I'm afraid there's not much else going on here that I can tell anyway. Maybe one notable thing I found during research is that there is a special two-player mode available when you link up two of the handheld PC Engine GT systems, but otherwise this is maybe just more of a curiosity for Shogi enthusiasts. And not even video pinball games can escape the grody monster treatment today as we look at Alien Crush, the first installment in the beloved Crush pinball series first released on the PC Engine in 1988 and also brought to North America in 1989. You essentially have a two-tiered pinball board fashioned with all sorts of H.R. Giger-inspired alien guts and creatures, along with open amp pathways to bonus rooms that would become a staple of the franchise where you might be bapping little skulls into pits, fighting off Slimer clones, or breaking apart giant worm beasts. At typical of most pinball, your primary goal is purely to get a crap ton of points and top the leaderboard. To technically beat the game and explode the playing field, you'll need to roll over the score with nearly a billion points, not an easy feat that could easily take several hours of skilled play. But whether you're trying to beat it or not, this is still great fun and a classic in the video pinball genre with a great feeling physics for the time. Maybe with a minor complaint of the two parts of the board being static screens instead of the entire screen scrolling around and following along with the ball. Alien Crush's follow-up in 1990 switches out the alien-themed board and goes for a demonic vibe with Devil's Crush, increasing the playfield to three different areas, adding a dynamic camera, a nudge button, improved physics, even more variety in its bonus room boss battles, and tons of meandering skeletons, cultists, and monsters to bounce off of. Top it off with an unprecedented presentation for video pinball games at the time with fantastic occult flavored graphics and an absolute banger of a soundtrack. And you get what in my opinion is the best of the four different Crush pinball games and honestly the best video pinball game of all time. This would also get a really well done port on the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive with some very subtle differences in the physics but more noticeably with a few differences in the boss fights and a brutally difficult final boss. But you really can't go wrong with any of the versions. It's challenging, but feels as fair as pinball can get, the bonus rooms are really creative, and the highly engaging monster-infested playfield really leans into a unique kind of pinball gameplay that you probably could never experience on a real pinball table.
And to wrap things up here, I did want to quickly run through a handful of RPGs and other titles that still have some obvious or not so obvious horror themes, but are unfortunately lacking any English translations, and probably too text heavy to be able to really delve into without understanding Japanese. Last Armageddon is a post-apocalyptic RPG about demons versus robots with an absolutely rad opening cutscene. This one did get a Famicom port and fan translation for that version at least. Suzano o Densetsu is another post-apocalyptic RPG, humans versus demons this time, I think, and notably based on a manga by Go Nagai of Devilman and Cutie Honey fame. Joseikin Necromancer is a spooky looking RPG by Hudson Soft, which does have a basic English patch for menuing, but sadly nothing for all of the other text yet. In a weird tease, this was strangely made available for purchase on the Wii U shop in North America, but it was still entirely in Japanese. Benkei Gaiden is a 1989 Sunsoft RPG, looking very much like a classic Dragon Quest, and seems like it might dip into yokai slaying and other supernatural themes. Fiend Hunter is an intriguing looking action RPG about demon hunting, with some cool cutscenes and heaps of voice acting. And there's some janky gameplay to be enjoyed here, but it definitely seems to prioritize plot over coherent platforming. Shin Megami Tensei is almost a household name now, and did receive a port to the PC Engine the year following the original Super Famicom release. That original does have a fan translation, fortunately, but this version might be notable for fans of the series for having some additional story scenes added in. La Place No Ma is a survival horror RPG classic that started on Japanese computers and was eventually ported to the Super Famicom and PC Engine CD. Again, you might opt for the Super Famicom version at this point for its fan translation, but this one also gets some nice cutscenes added on. Ghost Sweeper Mikami would get a game on the PC Engine CD, taking the form of a visual novel meets card battle game, in stark contrast to the action platformer previously seen on the Super Famicom. You could probably figure out the card game aspect in this without knowing Japanese, but I'm not sure it's worth it with such an emphasis on story and fully voiced dialogue here. Also on the visual novel tip, the supernatural themed anime and manga series 3 by 3 Eyes would see one here, along with two different and pretty nice looking visual novels for the Mamono Hunter Yoko series. And finally, in one of the more unique untranslated entries, we have Hyaku Monogatari. Not so much a game, but more of a multimedia compilation of scary stories, where choosing a candle from the main menu plays spooky slideshows with atmospheric music and sound. And that finishes off our excursion through horror on the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine. I had such a great time researching this one, and learned so much about this exotic library of games. And as always, if you think I might have overlooked the title, please feel free to mention it in the comments. And if you've enjoyed this format, make sure to check out other similar videos that I've put together for other systems like the NES and Sega Genesis, and hopefully you can expect to see more projects like this from me in the future. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll catch you next time.